But your mercury poison, you have lots of mercury in your thigh bone and your toenails and your kneecaps and your nose and stuff. It doesn't matter. Those aren't sensitive tissues. They can have lots of mercury in them. It doesn't hurt you. The problem is mercury that's in your brain and your thyroid gland and your adrenal glands and your liver. Those are sensitive tissues. You do not want to help any of the mercury go from your kneecap to your liver or your nose to your thyroid gland or your thigh bone to your brain. Can't have that happen or you get worse, not better. That's why you're taking the lipoic acid frequently is so that it doesn't move around and concentrate into the sensitive tissues, which also have a higher affinity for mercury than the other tissues. But enough mercury in you that if it all went to your brain, you'd die. You don't want it to do that. You want it to all come out. The Vidal Speaks Podcast. Episode 39, Dr. Andy Cutler, Ph.D., How to Properly Chelate from Mercury Poisoning. Welcome to Vidal Speaks. My name is Deborah Vidal, former 11-year LPGA golf pro turned classical homeopath, certified plant-based nutritionist, and wellness coach. Each week here on Vidal Speaks, we bring you knowledge inspiration, or natural remedies to help you take charge of your health and feel your best. I believe health is freedom and knowledge is power, so tuning in each week will give you the power to take steps towards freeing yourself from the chains that hold you back from having the energy to do all you want in life. No matter where you are in your journey of wellness, Vidal Speaks can help. I promise. Hi everyone, happy Vidal Speaks Day today. It's my favorite time of year, fall. I love fall. Cool or cold nights and cooler days. I know we don't really have big season changes in LA, but I'm not a person that likes those hot summers, so I long for fall. A smell of the holidays around the corner and the nights with our delicious hemp milk vegan hot chocolates with a fire in the fireplace. I know, I'm a romantic at heart but I do love this time of year. Last week's show was a huge success, meaning that it had the most listens more than any other show, and that shows you just how many people are not feeling well or suspecting or knowing they have mercury poisoning. But also, it shows you how many people want to hear Dr. Cutler speak about this subject because he truly has helped so many reverse their autism or mercury poisoning state with his protocol. And I think you guys know this already, but I like to conduct interviews that are in-depth and where I can get all my questions answered. And if this is two hours, then so be it. I'll just make it into two episodes. But I'm not willing to interview a person like Dr. Cutler that has so much wisdom to share with all of us in 20 or 30 minutes because you just can't get the same substance. So I think having so much of his wisdom about how we get poisoned, how to recognize it, and how to recover all in one place, along with his ideas on vaccinations and how the medical system is doing us wrong, all right here in two episodes on the Vidal Speaks podcast, makes it a great place now for many to hear the whole story from him. I'm so proud he could share all this information with me so we both could make it a wonderful resource for the future to get the message out and to help people find hope to heal via his protocol. As I said, I was super happy that Andy gave me so much of his time because the subject is complex and so many people are sick with mercury poisoning and don't even know it. And these poor people are seeking out doctor after doctor, natural practitioners, acupuncturists, and so many others to try to help find a way to heal and no one can even tell them they're experiencing mercury poisoning. So my hope is last week's show and this one today both combined will give many out there enough information to suspect that you or anyone you know may be suffering from mercury poisoning. And if you're listening to the show for the first time because you already know you're mercury poisoned and you're currently on his protocol or you're a parent of an autistic child using his protocol or investigating it, then I want to welcome you to the show. If you have any other specifics or topics that you would like me to interview Dr. Cutler on in the future, please write me at contact at vidalspeaks.com. 
And I also send all of you a big hug and healing wishes in your Mercury recovery journey. And just know that you will get well. Although it's not an easy road, I know, but there's so many doing his protocol with happy endings, so hang in there. And also for those of you that are healthy out there or not having any issues with Mercury, Dr. Cutler's information that he shares in these episodes will help you to understand just how easily it is to get poisoned and how one decision could change our future so fast and so drastically if we just follow what often our doctor is recommending without knowing what the real risks are. Remember, information or knowledge is power, and my main goal here is to educate you about the truths behind what we're often told is safe. Today's show is also dedicated to my mom, Phyllis Mary Coleman Vidal, who died from mercury poisoning from a flu shot, which led to Guillain Barre syndrome. My mom was the sunny of so many people's life. She was never sick a day in her life, and her decision that day to get a flu shot while she was at the pharmacy changed and finally ended her life prematurely. But my mom guides me from the heavens now, and may this information save the lives of many others before it's too late. I'm not going to introduce Dr. Cutler again, so if you didn't hear his bio, you can read it in my show notes, or you can listen to last week's episode number 38. I do want to remind you guys to buy his book, Amalgam Illness, Diagnosis and Treatment, and his other book is Hair Test Interpretation, Finding Hidden Toxicities. You can buy them at his website, noamalgam.com. And please go to his website and check it out and look around. There's so much there for free. It's really packed with information. Remember that Dr. Cutler knows firsthand about mercury poisoning since he too was poisoned. Thankfully, His chemistry degree and his degree in kinetics helped him make use of all the medical information that he found on how to chelate it out of his system. And since that time, he's just been passing on this information, always to help others heal. He currently works as a detox consultant and continues writing books. But if you guys are facing mercury poisoning symptoms, I just want to let you know that he has a Facebook group. It's called Dr. Cutler's Chelation Think Tank. And you can ask to join it. And once you get accepted, you'll find thousands of others there to help you through it and answer your questions. He has so much respect you'll see from so many people all over the world because so many have tried other methods and they just got sicker and then they found his protocol and got well. So thank you, Dr. Cutler, for all you've given to all of us. It's truly a gift. And I only wish I had known of this before so I could have saved my mom. But may this show help thousands of others now, thanks to your work. Okay, so are you guys ready? Get comfortable, relax, work, clean, drive, whatever it is you do when you're listening to the Vidal Speaks podcast. But be sure to concentrate on that info because you won't want to miss one sentence of this one, I promise. Okay, do you have those concentration ears on now? Be ready. Here we go. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the symptoms of mercury poisoning now. One thing I really learned in that movie that was kind of a revelation for me, knowing, you know, my mom's symptoms, but in that movie, they talked about getting after the mercury exposure, getting a rash all over their body. And when my mom got sick, she had gotten her flu shot and she was going to San Diego with her friend Lily the next day. And when she got off the plane in San Diego, she noticed she had this rash all over her legs and she was already feverish and had flu-like symptoms 24 hours later. And I was always wondering like, what, what was that rash all about? Was it like a fever rash? And then I learned when they were talking about how that's one of the big things that can happen is from mercury poisoning is this rash on the skin. And it was so interesting to put that symptom together in my mom's case. You know, you talk about medicine as a liberal art. It apparently wasn't always so. If you go read old medical books from when the doctors admitted that people got mercury poisoning and didn't recite some stuff about a few lab tests and then say, you know, like you don't have to check if they don't work in a mercury factory. 
you know, text after text after text, reciting the signs and symptoms of mercury poison, talking about things like rashes and peeling hands and feet and so on. And you can see it in lots of people. Mercury poisoning from 100 years ago still applies to people getting mercury poison today. People haven't really changed. And it's not something, like you said, that doctors are trained to recognize, so most of these patients fall through the cracks. Yep. And I would like to for you to describe, I know there are so many symptoms of mercury poisoning, but can you tell me like what are symptoms that you see the most? The problem with mercury is it causes all kinds of different symptoms because it interferes with a lot of different fundamental processes in your body. And which process it interferes in with you depends on your individual makeup. It would be the different than somebody else. Like some people become psychotic and are physically relatively healthy. Other people remain completely sane and become physically very, very sick. Depends on which particular proteins it binds to and disables. Because of this, it's relatively hard to diagnose because the easy way to diagnose is to have what's called a cardinal symptom or cardinal sign where everybody who has a certain condition has X and nobody who doesn't have it has X. Well, that doesn't exist for mercury. Mm -hmm. It requires thinking and knowing, you know, the two or three things spell mercury. And mercury poisoning, lead poisoning, whatever poison, not at all like having the flu, not at all like having a broken leg where either you have it or you don't. You know, it's like very sharply divided. You have it or you don't have it. Toxicity, you can be anywhere in between from very mild to very severe. And it's hard to figure out what's going on. With mercury, usually the psychological effects start earliest, which is social withdrawal and being kind of moody and emotionally bouncy and not really being able to understand what people mean so well not being able to pick your words so well, so you end up not interacting with people very much. you kind of, you know, like depressed, really life seems hopeless and helpless, and you don't get a lot of excitement and joy anymore. Thinking clearly is more difficult, but you're not having really physical symptoms yet. That's how it starts. And then by that time, if you've complained about it, doctors think you're depressed and want to give you something like Prozac and stop listening because they're taught that depressed people complain about everything. It doesn't mean anything. You know, and then you can get more severe problems, being allergic, being asthmatic, having all those skin rashes, having chronic fatigue, having MS, having Parkinson's, having ALS. These are all things mercury causes. You end up with this long list of diagnoses that are all supposedly unrelated and there's not much the doctors know what to do about them because they're not treating the real problem, mercury. So that's kind of how mercury poisoning goes. And if you want classic descriptions, there's aresism is the word that they use in all the textbooks and they don't define anymore. So the doctors don't know what it means. It's the mad hatter-like behavior of the crazy combination of shyness and being very forward and social withdrawal. Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatter, is a very good description of mercury poison person's behavior. And that's a good picture. Yeah, it's always good oh. to have a character so you kind of understand on a deeper level what it can feel like. So what about your protocol? Can you talk a little bit about what you do to help these people detoxify? I'd like to know a little. I know you have a book, and I'm going to put it in the show notes. It's at noamalgam.com. And I will put your both your links to your books there. but um, And you do have extreme details in your book about all of this. But just for the sake of the show, I'd like you to talk a little yeah, bit there, about your protocol. A lot of cases could be very easy if people realize what they have at time. And a lot of other people, even though they're very, very sick and they could use a lot of help, by that time they have had a lot of employment difficulty and they're estranged from everybody. Everybody thinks it's all their hypochondriacs and they don't have many options. You can get better by first you get rid of whatever source of exposure you have, which unfortunately in many adults involves a lot of mercury fillings in their teeth, which is expensive and unpleasant to get rid of. And you have to really camp on the dentist to make sure they don't leave any behind because it might be a lot easier to leave a little bit there and put a crown over it or something because that's still very toxic. And then when it's all gone, you take some basic vitamins that are meant to oppose the toxic effects of mercury on your physiology. Mercury is an oxidation catalyst. Mercury impairs your body's ability to move minerals around the way it's supposed to. So you take some vitamin C and E as antioxidants. 
you take zinc and magnesium to make sure you have a plentiful supply of the minerals that it's usually making below. And to make this work right, you take the C and magnesium with each meal, and at bedtime, the zinc and vitamin E is taken daily. Once you've been doing that a couple of weeks, you can chelate, which you can get prescription chelating agents or, you know, get them by for a mail order or what have you, have you like DMPS or DMSA. And those will help clear out your bloodstream and your extracellular compartment. But to really get the mercury out of inside your cells and inside your brain, use alpha lipoic acid, which is an over-the-counter nutritional supplement. It's very inexpensive. And the key part here is the kinetics. These things last a certain period of time in your body, and you need to keep taking them frequently enough that you maintain a nice steady blood level so that they don't just move the mercury around, wash it out of where it is, and let it go somewhere else. they got to be there and help it stay coming out. So with alpha lipoic acid, you take it every three or four hours from when you start till when you end. So you might wake up on Friday, take it, and every three hours, take it until you go to bed, and then take it every four so you don't wake up as many times as you need to. Until you wake up, then it's every three again. Keep going, and then on Sunday night, you stop. And then if you're doing well enough by next weekend, you do it again. If not, you wait till the weekend after. And you keep doing that many times. And part of the many times is your body has a natural response to this where it takes about a year for everything to clear out naturally anyway, and you can't speed that up. And because, you know, basically nobody's ever taken this seriously, they're not really good chelators available. It's not really like people tried 100,000 compounds and alpha lipoic acid is the best one. People really haven't tried but a few things, and alpha lipoic acid is really the only one they understand very well that will clear it out of your brain. So you have to use it for a while. So, but there's a lot of horror stories of people that do not your protocol. Lots of horror stories. It's very easy to end up really horribly worse. Go listen to a doctor who thinks they know what they're doing. The liberal arts style, they don't understand how to figure it out. For other drugs, they rely on what the drug rep tells them. They don't figure out whether you need it two or three times a day. Drug rep tells them whether you need it two or three times a day. There's no drug rep for alpha lipoic acid. Nobody ever figured this out but me. Wow. So your big thing is about this half-shelf life, like you can't let it wear off. You have to just keep it in the body yeah. at a steady pace. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the difference between taking it once a day and taking it properly every three or four hours is like taking a big fistful of aspirin on Sunday so you don't hurt all week. Uh -huh. You're going to die. You can't do that. But if you don't pay attention to how long it lasts in your body, it makes perfect sense. You know, over a week, you might need six aspirin a day to feel good. So why not take 42 on Sunday? That makes but sense. Every, everybody knows that's a really bad idea. <laughs> you can't bad do that. <laughs> Same with alpha lipoic acid. Well, and the reason also to do it that way, right, is because if they keep a steady flow, then you're moving the things out. And if you don't move yeah. them out, the dangerous thing about detox and the hard thing about it, especially a serious detox, is that you've got this reabsorption problem where you're pushing something out, you stop taking the alpha lipoic acid, and it starts reabsorbing back into the blood and the brain. Is that correct? Yeah, Part of what happens with most of these toxins like mercury, they go all over your body. They might be much more concentrated after a while in your brain or whatever. But your mercury poison, you have lots of mercury in your thigh bone and your toenails and your kneecaps and your nose and stuff. It doesn't matter. Those aren't sensitive tissues. They have lots of mercury in them. It doesn't hurt you. The problem is mercury that's in your brain and your thyroid gland and your adrenal glands and your liver. Those are sensitive tissues. You do not want to help any of the mercury go from your kneecap to your liver or your nose to your thyroid gland or your thigh bone to your brain. can't have that happen or you get worse, not better. Hmm. That's why you're taking the lipoic acid frequently is so that it doesn't move around and concentrate into the sensitive tissues, which also have a higher affinity for mercury than the other tissues. You have enough mercury in you that if it all went to your brain, you'd die. You don't want it to do that. You want it to all come out. And Taking the alpha acid frequently makes it come out. So some of these protocols of these other methods that I've read and people that are doing like professional detox or claim they do, they're using like IV glutathione and IV ALA, alpha lipoic acid, 
And a lot of people said it was just like too fast and they got sick and they're still sick many years later. So their thinking was, or they were told by this person who does a detox that if they do this IV glutathione and ALA, that it'll push everything out fast or whatever. But in your opinion, the only way to go is the slow way and the, the steady administration of the alpha lipoic acid. Correct. Or your DMSA or the MPSL have how often you have to give them and you can't give them further apart than that. If you take the DMSA, are you taking it along with the alpha lipoic acid or on different hours? You, you no, know, you, when you take two things, you take them together or you'll go insane keeping track. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> So you have to combine them or you're you just going nuts and there's, and you don't need to, you know, they don't need to be rigidly only every X hours. They need to be every X hours or more often is always okay. That keeps things very even and steady. And the DMSA helps people have less side effects? It helps a lot of people have less side effects. If you have significant amounts of lead and you remove that and the lipoic acid does not remove lead. It's not absolutely necessary for most people to take the MSA, but a lot of people do it. In a lot of situations, you know, particularly for an adult, in a lot of situations, it's really not clear how much lead they have in their system because we don't, you know, lead is banned for all kinds of uses like paint and gasoline now. Mm-hmm. But over 50, you were supposed to tons of it when you were little. Mm-hmm. It could still be in there. Lead never really comes out until you chelate it. So you, a lot of people, you're not sure what they have. So you use some DMSA to not have to figure it out. Yeah, and does your protocol work for other heavy metals, like not yes. just lead, but other poisons? It takes, takes out mercury, lead, antimony, arsenic. So it's a good protocol to do anyway. Yeah, and, and if you you know if you use DMSA and ALA, then it takes out all the common toxic metals. And you don't have to figure out exactly which ones you do and don't have. That's complicated to figure that out. If you don't have to figure it out, you know, when you get better, it doesn't really matter. Now, what about using, I know a lot of people either sell or use Corella and cilantro for chelating mercury. What do you think about this? Nobody should ever do that. Yeah. A lot of catastrophic stories, almost no good stories. Really? And so along in your protocol, you're using your ALA and the DMSA and some minerals like zinc, magnesium, vitamin C, and vitamin E. Mm -hmm. Those are the basics. Yep. Wow, that sounds cool. I really, I want to do it. I'm really into detoxing because before my life as a homeopath, I was a professional golfer and I was exposed to a lot of pesticides to say the least along, you know, some pesticides they say can have mercury or some other heavy metals in them. So I've worked hard on trying to detox. I want to, I want to try your method and just see how it goes. Cause it sounds like it could just pull out things, even if you don't know they're there. Yeah. It doesn't matter at all. If you know they're there, if they're there and it takes them out, they'll come out. If they're not there, it doesn't matter. It's, it's one of the things people get confused about the causes an enormous amount of havoc, an enormous amount of people getting horribly sick. It absolutely does not matter what the doctor wants or intends or think is going on. It does not matter what you think is going on. All that matters is what chemicals are there and how you use them. Laws of nature determine what the chemicals do. They don't care why the doctor prescribed them. So if you're taking alpha lipoic acid once or twice or three times a day as an antioxidant, it's chelating you doesn't matter if the doctor's too stupid to know it's a chelate. It's still chelating you. If you think you have no toxins in you, but it turns out you do have some, it's moving them around. I want to ask you this because my partner, Lloyd, he has neuropathy, and it's of the unknown origin, seen 25 doctors we gave up a long time ago, but there's nothing in his spine. They've, we've done every test. And my sense, I always tell him, Wow, it's like you have mercury symptoms because his symptoms are very much like the homeopathic remedy, mercury, which is a lot of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Since you're a homeopath, you have a very easy time figuring out who's toxic. It's if they match mercury, right. match arsenic, they have arsenic. The it's so amazing. Descriptions. People don't remember this. Homeopathic prescribing information is descriptions of poisoned people that homeopathic doctors sat and watched. Yeah. These are the signs. Into symptoms of toxicity. 
I know. It's so interesting to hear when you talk about this stuff because I know Mercury has a remedy so well and it's all the thing. It's the Mad Hatter. It's yeah. the dark. The, it's all the hyperactivity. All the, It's a great, it's one of our main remedies for neurological complaints, for MS, for Parkinson's, for hyperactive kids, for ADHD, uh, for autism. It causes it's, those things. Yeah. It's so, because, you know, like cures like is our homeopathic mm-hmm. statement. So, but I was curious with Lloyd's neuropathy, do you, I really want to try this with them because we've worked so hard at trying to figure out a way to heal his neuropathy, his feet, it's in his feet and somewhat his hands, but his feet are really painful. And mercury toxicity would have a huge effect on causing neuropathy, am I not right? All the all the heavy metals cause neuropathy. Stocking. So, m- so multiple sclerosis, neuropathy, neuritis, all these nerve issues could be mercury or have other heavy metals. Yep. So you think that would be a great thing to start with him because I didn't know for a long time that ALA until I got into your material was used around the clock like that. I gave him a lot of this stuff, but not in the right manner, which is what in your book, a lot of people that find you say, I've done a lot of this stuff, but now you put it together in the exact amounts and what to do. And do you think if someone like him who's had it for seven or eight years now could still get better his nerves? Yeah. yeah. Because I always worry about a nerve dying, but I don't think his are dead yet because it moves around. Still having sensation, it's just not ones he likes. You know, they're, they're still working just not properly. He's not like numb and unable to move. Right. He has some numbness in his feet, but it still moves around, which is a good sign. And his nerves are are working fine. It's just they're not working right. And do you think it's likely that it's what it is because there's no other reason or cause we can find? It's really hard to tell, particularly given the minimal history you've provided. But if he doesn't have mercury fillings, it's pretty easy to try it. If he has mercury fillings, then you want a lot more certainty before you mess with those. But as long yeah. as, as long as he's filling, you know, mercury filling free, it's very easy to try chelation. And if he has all the sensory neuropathy, he's going to feel a change when he chelates, and it may change for the better, it may change for the worse. Well, he's got chelator in his system, he's going to have that as a side effect. So he's going to feel feel temporarily worse. He might, but, you know, he can take more medicine to control that while he does it. But he'll know right away if it's heavy metal, if he chelates and the sensation changes. Mm -hmm. Even if the sensation is more. Yeah, even if the sensation is more that says, yeah, it's heavy metal. Well, it's moving around and taking more side effects. And so this idea of taking the mercury out of your teeth and the, your fillings, he, we have a natural dentist and he does this special x-ray that's not, you know, done the normal way. It's digital x-ray and he can see things. And he found a speck of mercury in one of Lloyd's teeth. He said that wasn't removed all the way. And, he, and when you have crowns, I had that problem. I thought I was mercury free for years and had to replace the crown. And the dentist went, oh, my God, mercury. Yep. So, how does someone detect? Do they have to take the crown off to know if there's mercury under there? It's very difficult, and sometimes that's the only solution. Um, sometimes, if you get old dental records, you can figure it out. You know, if the old dental records show there was never a filling in that tooth, then a crown got put on. It's not likely to be mercury. If the person remembers mm-hmm. the procedure well enough, they may remember what the dentist did and said. Sometimes, if the, if the den, you know, dentist now angles the x-ray various different ways, he can get a glimpse of it, tell what's going on. Sometimes not. Sometimes, if there's mercury under, you'll see gray discoloration around the margin of the crown. Sometimes not. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of guessing games when you have a crown to try to figure out what's under it. Sometimes, if you're lucky, the crowns fall off, and every dentist has the clever tricks they try to use to encourage it to fall off. Because if it falls off, like if you chew taffy and it pops off, it can be glued right back off. There's no, you don't have to buy another crown. If they have to pry it off, it deforms, and you're going to have to buy another crown. That's very expensive. Yeah, that's, I know, an issue. So, you get into this really intractable guessing game when somebody's got crowns of, you know, what's under them. How do you figure it out? 
usually a lot of detective work homework. Well, and if someone already has very specific symptoms of heavy metal poisoning, yeah. even especially mercury, it may be worth the money that you're going to spend to take the crowns off because it could save you a lot of years. You know, if you were sure there was mercury there, the money's not that. But when you're not sure, you might spend a few thousand dollars to find out, I didn't have to do that. That's very intractable, yeah. particularly because people that are sick by the time they're exploring for mercury usually are not in a great financial situation, usually not in a great employment situation because all the doctors kept telling them nothing was wrong and they should buck up till they were mildly sick and they sought alternative care. But that's so true because most of them, you know, end up depressed on antidepressants, losing their job. And it's exactly what you said about that. But in your protocol, you don't want a person to have one little speck, even if they left one speck behind. You don't want them starting your protocol until it's all out, right? Yep. Get it out of there. And the, and the, and the difficult thing, when people chelate and get better, they don't go take off their crowns to check just for fun. So... For all I know, people who chelated successfully with dribs of mercury actually sealed under something. But I do know many, many instances where the dentist was sure it was sealed under a crown and it still poisoned them and they were not able to chelate properly. Mm -hmm. So if you find the mercury, get it out of there. And do you find other detox things that adults or kids can do, like, say, infrared saunas? Or we, we've done a lot of coffee enemas to help our liver detox some of these things. Do you feel like diet? Lifestyles, infrared saunas are things that could help? Any form of sauna can help, and you don't have to remove the mercury fillings to do it. Good. The infrared sauna, I offer a caution that a lot of them are of crappy, low quality, and they don't heat you uniformly because they don't use enough heaters. And your body is not adapted to handle that very well, and when you're toxic, it has particular difficulty doing that. So in some of these saunas that are put together with lots of phenol formaldehyde resin and lots of pie, and then they have, you know, like two heaters, those make people really sick. So I tell people, be really careful about the infrared saunas. If all I know is it's an infrared sauna, I'll tell you not to use it. Lots of them are fine, but lots of them aren't. Anyway, anything that heats your body uniformly and induces a lot of sweating is great. That helps you detox. You have to sweat a lot. You know, do a lot of solder, but if you want to do that, you don't have to mess with dental work or anything. And what about, would you use the same protocol, whether it was pesticides as a heavy metal, or would it be different? Most pesticides aren't don't contain heavy metals. If there's heavy metals, it doesn't matter how they got into this protocol, takes them out. If it's non-heavy metal toxins like pesticide, for each toxin, there's a different way to get it out. Sauna is about the most general form of detox where almost all of the toxins that you're talking about will come out in a sauna. Um, it's not as, it's not as good as like the exact right way to detox, but if you don't know what's there or it's a whole bunch of things, sauna is a great place to start. And I was People, thinking like a lot of these kids with glyphosate toxicity from our food. I know I see a lot of these kids that have problems with these GMO foods. So I was wondering if that's just part of the immune problem, pro most likely, but still, it's a very toxic substance that would be... Yeah, if you, if you can get them to do sauna and sweat, that will help with it. Mm -hmm. the, the caution with people with mercury or antimony is a lot of times they have low magnesium levels and you need enough magnesium to be able to sweat properly. So you don't want to put somebody in the sauna who doesn't have an intact sweating reflex because they'll get overheated and it will hurt them. But as long as they get enough magnesium, they usually will sweat properly. So, you know, make sure you get lots of magnesium in them, give them a lot of sauna. It can detox a lot of different things. It doesn't clear out your brain or organs, but you get a fair amount of improvement just through getting, you know, the bloodstream scrub clean. Right. And it seems like magnesium is such an important mineral for many other conditions. Is it specifically important for mercury and heavy metals? Yes. The reason for that is mercury and antimony and platinum, if they had chemotherapy with it, mess up your body's ability to handle magnesium right. And as a consequence, everybody with those will be low. It's very hard to get enough into them and keep them at adequate levels. That's so that's so amazing because Lloyd never has been able to take one little microgram of magnesium. I've been giving him ionic magnesium now because he can handle it. 
but he just has never been able. And he's so, he has every deficiency of magnesium symptoms. So I'm pretty sure he's mercury toxic. Yeah, well, it's entirely possible. Time to take a little break. And while you do that, I just want to ask all the new listeners out there to help support the work of this show by using my Amazon banner on the Vidal Speaks website for any of your shopping needs. If you go to the site, which is vidalspeaks.com, and just click on my Amazon banner there, it'll take you to the Amazon page. And if you just bookmark that page in the future, you can just click on your bookmark to get there. And by using that Amazon banner on my page, it allows you to support my efforts at no cost to you because with every purchase, they send me a small commission. And I have no idea what people buy or who's using it, so your privacy is protected. I so appreciate all of you that are already using it. And also, another ask I have of you guys is to post this episode on your Facebook page or Twitter and get the word out about the dangers of mercury. Give it to any friend who has mystery symptoms or that you think it could help them. And I know many of you listening today are in Dr. Cutler's chelation think tank group already. So feel free to share this with my permission any way you want to. I would so appreciate that because we all have the same purpose, which is to get the message out of Dr. Cutler's protocol and the dangers of mercury. This needs attention, and people really need to know how to chelate properly. There are so many wrong and dangerous methods, and I want to get Dr. Cutler's protocol out there. So share it, please. Also, if you enjoyed the Dr. Cutler interview please take the time to review the show in iTunes. With your review, it helps the show move up in the charts, and that helps Dr. Cutler's episode get more listens, which helps us all get the word out. There's an easy link at the bottom of the show notes that you can click on and do the review in just one minute. So please, if you feel inspired, compliment this interview in your review or the show in general. Thanks in advance. Okay, you guys, now back to the show. And let's talk a little bit about the testing now. What kind of tests do you recommend or do you think it's not important for people to know how much of what they have? Or do you use just hair tests or urine tests or blood tests? Or what is the benefits to these and the downfalls? The downfall is people get involved in testing without understanding how to interpret it and see a bunch of quack doctors who don't think that needing that they need to know what they're doing. So they order enormous amount of tests, squander lots of money as a patient, end up with no useful information. You do not need tests to manage treatment. You need tests sometimes to decide what they have. If you don't know what they have, you don't know what to do about it. Once you know what they have, you usually have a pretty clear idea of what it's doing to them. You don't need a bunch of tests to figure it out. You just say, you know, they have mercury. Their magnesium is going to be low. Their zinc is going to be low. They're going to have oxidative stress. Everybody with mercury has that. You don't need tests to prove it. If you don't know what they have, you might want to look for those as markers. But the most useful thing is hair test. And for children, you have to get it from doctors at laboratories because they have pediatric normal ranges. For adults, there are some other laboratories that are okay. And the key thing is those are almost always interpreted wrong by doctors who don't pay enough attention to learning what they're doing. They interpret it like a ballerina would, which is just look at the bars and say, oh, that's the high one that must be toxic. Oh, that's the low one that must need to have a deficiency. That's not always true. When I talked about mercury dysregulates or impairs the transport of minerals in your body, that means the amount of minerals that get into your hair when you have a mercury problem doesn't reflect what's in your body. So you take a hair test, you look at the highs and lows, you treat accordingly. It doesn't do any good because the hair test isn't telling you how much is in the person's body if they have mercury. You look for patterns of highs and lows, and that tells you do they have mercury or not. If they have mercury, you deal with the mercury, and you know what the mercury does to them. Mm-hmm. It causes low things. If they don't have mercury, then you believe the hair test and do what it says. But one of the things I found with like autistic kids, you will do a hair test because I did a lot of hair tests and they would come out with looking like no mercury at all because they're so bad at excreting anything. It impairs the transport of minerals like itself. 
You know, the most common thing that happens is somebody with mercury poisoning doesn't put it in their hair and doesn't have much in their urine or bloodstream because the impairment of mineral transport keeps it from getting there. Yeah. So you think when, if you don't know what you're doing, you look and you go, oh, good, that my child's not mercury toxic or I'm, I don't have mercury, but then you start uh, doing... aluminum, which every kid that has mercury has a very high aluminum bar, but they're like, oh, the mercury bar is low, but they have all that aluminum. They must be aluminum toxic. That cadmium is so high, they must be cadmium toxic. Cadmium is always an artifact. You never see the kids having cadmium. Every once in a while, you find an adult that does. Antimony is real high. Sometimes that is real. Arsenic sometimes is real. Mm-hmm. Uh, Why is cadmium high then if it's the not real? Mineral transport derangement that usually pushes it through the ceiling. The amount in the hair doesn't reflect the amount in the body when the mercury is messing up how the minerals are moved. One of the ways it does it is it makes too much go in the hair. It seems to do that for cadmium pretty frequently. Hmm. So I used a lab that was called Analytical Research Lab. I don't know if you know them. Right. ARL test does not have pediatric normal ranges, but for mercury, it also has a different issue, which is they test for 16 essential and other elements, and doctors, they test for 22. The difference between 16 and 22 is that the ARL test is statistically a lot less sensitive to the effect of the mercury messing up the mineral transport. You get all these results where the doctor's data, extra six elements would tell you, yes, it's happening or no, it's not happening. But on the ARL test, it's hard to tell. I see. To get a doctor's data test, you either order it through some online places that get it, have a doctor sign it for them. Mm-hmm. You get somebody with some sort of healthcare license to sign off, either for the patient or if you're a practitioner where that doesn't happen to have a license, there's usually a way to get a chiropractor or MD or somebody to sign authorizing you to order tests. And doctor's data might talk to you about how to do that. I don't, I don't order any tests myself because I'm careful to stay way far away from the line of practicing medicine. Right, right, right. For sure. So I don't, and, but you like the doctor's data test even if it's for adults. For adults, a TEI test is fine. If people are in Canada, the Rocky Mountain Analytical Laboratory tests are fine for both children and adults. The usual problem is you have children, you order anything other than a doctor's data or RMAL test, they don't have pediatric ranges, you can't figure out what test means at all. So if an adult did the doctor's data test, they only do pediatric levels? No, no, no. They, that- do, they have reference ranges for whatever age and sex you are doctor's data is fine for everybody. The problem is once a practitioner picks a lab, they tend to order from it all the time. Yeah. They tend not to pay attention to how old is the person or sign an order and not understand the per- you know, the person's asking for their adult child or their pediatric mm-hmm. child or whatever, or the person's going to actually use the test to send in, you know, like their kid's hair. And what is the name of the test that doctors dad? Is there one only one test they do for the problem, heavy metals? There's two tests, and the one you want is called hair elements. Okay. There's a test that's called the hair toxic element exposure profile, which is not suitable when you don't want. It. Okay. And have you heard of a, a test called uh, mercury speciation tri-test? Yeah, I, that's useless. Okay. Because and what about a DMSA right. challenge test? Useless and dangerous. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Really. That's great to know. So an ongoing test necessary or not? No. So once you do the first one, that's enough? There's rarely situations where ongoing testing is appropriate, but people don't think straight. What's the testing for? The testing is understand what you have. Once you know what you have, the progression of events you should experience is well known. You don't need more testing unless something funny happens you don't expect. Okay. You don't need to turn yourself into a scientific experiment at great expense by measuring a lot of stuff that's happening in you just like it did in the last 100,000 people who detoxed. Right. You only need testing when something weird is happening and it's not good, you don't like it, and you don't know what it is. And then some testing might be appropriate to figure out what's happening and how to control it. But as long as you've 
established what's wrong and you're doing something that's correcting it, you don't need more testing. So if you're one of those people that maybe you're not pushing out because it's displacing minerals, Mm -hmm. would it be worth doing two or three to see if you are? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because let's say your test results came and showed you had no mercury and a person says, well, I don't have mercury. My symptoms can't be from that, but it's better just to go no, by your no, symptoms. No, no. Now you're asking a different question. You have a patient who doesn't believe your diagnosis. That is something you do all the testing in the world to get them on board so that they get better. Because if they don't believe you, they're not going to do what you say. Right. And that's where a lot of the testing that's actually not technically useful, like challenge tests and stuff comes in, is... Which doctors use that to convince the patients that the patient really has what the doctor says so they comply with treatment and get better? Mm -hmm. In the formal sense of how doctors like to talk about what they're doing, that's not a legitimate use. But in fact, it's legitimate. Obviously, the person doesn't get better if the doctor tells them what's wrong. doctor had it figured out, but the patient doesn't believe them. Testing to convince the patient is a separate thing. Testing to understand what they have. It's not necessary to keep repeating that. Right. So you're basically saying if they have all the symptoms of heavy metal toxicity, testing is not even that necessary to do at all. Correct. It's just what you what you typically get into. You know, if somebody's classic symptoms are mercury poisoning, you don't really need to test. But if they have, you know, all their molars filled with mercury, and you're like, yeah, go to the dentist, spend $10,000 getting that fixed. They might say, I'm not sure I believe that, you know, just yeah. like you think I look like I have mercury. How likely is it really, you know, <laughs> how sure are you? Well, right. the time that some testing is appropriate because they want some real certainty before they go through all of the unpleasantness of dental. Of course. And, oh, yeah, oh. that makes sense. And what about alpha lipoic acid, any particular brand or amount of milligrams? Brand doesn't really matter. You usually want to start at 25 or 50 milligrams and adjust up or down based on how it feels. So, and what's the highest someone would take? 200 milligrams, 300. Okay. And is that 200 milligrams every three hours? Yeah. Per dose, yeah. What Don't there, start there. Some people are very sensitive, and there's no way to predict who's who. Start at 25 or 50, go through the round at that level. If you don't feel anything, try twice as much next time. Okay. If you feel like you're going to die by the end of the first day, stop. Try half as much next time. Okay. Good advice. And vitamin C, can they do acerola cherry powder kind of food vitamin C, or does it need to be a certain kind? It doesn't matter what kind it is, but it's uneconomic and impractical to get enough of the, you know, like food-derived stuff. Okay. So if you use acerola cherry powder, you know, if they want to eat a bowl of that with every meal, that's fine. But, you know, it's like $20, $30. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. If they want, you know, to spend a nickel, swallow a one-gram tablet with each meal, that works fine, too. And just absorbic acid? Usually you want a buffered form, sodium ascorbate, calcium ascorbate, magnesium ascorbate. Okay. Because ascorbic acid is an acid. and if you take it with meals, usually that helps you digest. But, you know, the one you take at bedtime, you usually don't have enough food. Mm-hmm. So it gives you, you know. And what about the IVs of vitamin C? Is that helpful? Those are usually very helpful, but you have to really camp on the doctor to make sure he doesn't throw in something like alpha lipoic acid or glutathione to help you. Right. And if it's just strictly vitamin, vitamin C, C, can... Vitamin C, magnesium, calcium, it's great. Very helpful. And uh, can they do high dose? Like some of these vitamin C places that do for cancer, they're like 25 yeah, grams or yeah. 50,000 grams. 50 grams is fine. 50,000 grams? 50,000 milligrams, which is 50 grams. Okay, so 50 grams, right. And if they mix the magnesium in, what would be a good amount in your IV of magnesium? If they have like a, a liter bag, they'll typically add one vial of the 50% magnesium sulfate um, or 5 or 10 cc's of the magnesium chloride 10% solution. If a doctor's interested, I can share recipes with them. It's not the kind of thing that you should go in there and recite to them what you want. They should get a recipe and use it off of a written piece of paper. 
Okay. So you don't recommend any brand of DMSA kind of any brand is okay? If you can get it, it's fine. It just should smell really bad. If it doesn't smell really bad, it's been oxidized. It's not active. Okay. That's a good tip. So do you think um, people can heal permanently from this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, lots of people. Dramatic, long-lasting improvement. And are there people that don't get better, and is there a reason why maybe they don't? The most common reason people don't get better is they go, let a witch doctor mess them up really, really, really bad with an inappropriate and harmful chelation protocol. Um, second most common reason is they just give up, don't do it, don't stick with it, usually because they won't take psych meds when they need them. And the third most common reason is not everybody has mercury. You get all kind of people that are very messed up, doctor doesn't know what's going on. Every once in a while you find one has something else. Got hit in the head, had a traumatic brain injury, doctor didn't realize it or did realize it. You chelate all you want, it's not going to help. People can have genetic thing, chelate all you want, not going to help. People could come down with hepatitis, whatever, chelation is not going to help. Hepatitis will make them more prone to become mercury toxic, so it's not uncommon to find a toxic person who has had hepatitis. But if you have somebody who has the kind of illness that has a lot of kind of general, vague, annoying symptoms like fatigue and malaise and sensitivity, and allergy, and, you know, spaciness. There's a lot of things that cause that that aren't mercury. The most common one by far is mercury. If you have 100 people come in because that's what they have, you're going to find 90 of them have mercury at least. Hmm. If you're out of 100 per people, there'll probably be a few that don't have mercury. And, and sometimes it's pretty apparent from their medical record that it isn't mercury. Other times it's not so easy to figure out. But it's not uncommon for people to have all kinds of consequent problems. You know, like basically whatever is arguing is happening with Hillary Clinton. She had a concussion. I think she's brain damaged. Well, some people that does happen. Other people, they have a concussion. They're fine. So you, know, yeah. you have somebody that got bad case of whiplash in a motor vehicle accident or something. Things they have mercury because all of their symptoms match it. Sometimes it's not mercury. Most of the time, mm-hmm. sometimes it's not. But of course, if you don't have this, kill it all you want. No improvement. Right. That's how you would know. Yeah. Ultimately, that's how you would know. But this is also some of the point of the hair tests and other tests is try to figure it out before they invest a lot of time and emotion and chelating because it takes a long time. You know, then they might do it for months and months and months and be like nothing's happening. Right. Spend a hundred dollars on a test and realize, yeah, it's not mercury. Don't have to do that. And speaking of time, I mean, is there, I know in your book, you talk about specific time frames for how sick someone is. Can you give me a from this amount of months to isn't it up to two years? It could be up to three years for people who haven't gotten messed up by alternative doctors. The difference between today and June 1999 is it's very much more common today that alternative doctors or people on their own initiative have managed to mess themselves up with alpha lipoic acid, cilantro, chlorella, things like that. 1999 was not that common. So if people do this kind of stuff, it can end up taking them a lot longer. You know, it goes slower. They have to be patient. The mercury waits there until they get around to it. And what about taking the minerals, the zinc and the magnesium? Can you do it ionically if people don't tolerate minerals very well? Uh, Yeah, you can do it however you want. Okay, so ionic minerals would work. Yeah, you just have to have enough of the mineral in it. But yeah, that's... It works. It's fine. It doesn't have to be a particular form. And magnesium is like 800 milligrams a day? Uh, four to 800, depending on the person. And you divide that up or that will be a laxative. And what about taking homeopathic mercury and a really low dose? Because this is what they do. Some of these people that specialize with homeopathic treatment of autistic kids. I think is that really bad have idea. You... And it's based on the outcomes I see. Homeopathy encourages the body's natural mechanisms to cure whatever's going on. body does not have a natural mechanism that allows mercury out of the brain. So what happens with homeopathic mercurious remedies for mercury toxic people or detox remedies, the detox remedy is actually much more dangerous than the mercurious remedies, is it 
helps the body move the mercury around. Some comes out, but some goes into their brain and then comes out of their brain. The brain's really where the sensitivity is. Now, food sensitivities and immune problems might get a lot better, but the underlying neurologic things are worsening at the same time. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that will be a good trade-off. Okay, you know, given their clinical situation, that might actually be appropriate. But it just makes it longer and more difficult to chelate them later. Right. And what about some of these things like what well, I juice and I often use cilantro in my juice. Would that be a bad idea? Yeah, I would recommend not doing that. Okay. Interesting. I wanted to just ask you if you could give three things to recommend to the listeners to just think you know, to help them understand what's really important today? Would there be three tips or three steps that you would recommend for everyone to pay extreme attention to? Yeah, there's absolutely no reason you need any more poison in you. It doesn't matter if you're perfectly healthy now or if you're sick as a dog. You just don't need any more poison in you. You don't need a doctor to give you more mercury. You don't need mercury painted on you. You don't need mercury injected in you. You don't need lead, you don't need arsenic, you don't need antimony. You just don't need to be poisoned anymore. Maybe it would be okay, maybe not. Why take the chance? If you are sick and you go to the doctor and they fix you up, great. Don't worry about mercury. It's when you go to the doctor and they can't fix you up and you have a chronic disease and they give you a disease name, but the prognosis is you suffer for a really long time, then you die, like Parkinson's or MS or ALS or Alzheimer's or autism. Think about mercury. It's probably mercury. You don't get better because they don't treat what you have. They do something else. Hmm. And keep in mind that none of us know everything. That includes doctors. So be cautious of all of the, oh, it's perfectly safe. Alpha lipoic acid, take it three times a day. The vaccine's perfectly safe. The statin's perfectly safe, whatever. Everything has risks. Walking out the door has risks. Staying in the house has risks. Crossing the street has risks. You get food poisoning from a piece of from an apple you bought at the store yesterday. Everything has some risk. If somebody's saying, oh, it's perfectly safe, that's because they don't know what you're talking about. They can't tell you any risk from it. They don't have enough experience. You can't rely on them. Doctor says vaccines have no risk, then you gotta find this, you know, like multi page form of a million horrible things it can do to your kid. Obviously there's some logical disconnect here. You're getting a sales pitch and something so the doctor's not in trouble and it turns out that he didn't tell you the whole story. You really want to buy under those circumstances. Okay, so that's great. Good advice. Now let's tell people, I'm going to remind people that you have a website that's www.noamalgam.com. And then there's one that's the same, noamalgam.com backslash hair test book dot HTML. I'll put these in the show notes. They can buy your books there. Do you want to tell people if where they can follow you? Like, do you have Facebook or Twitter or any other way they can follow you? There's a couple of Facebook private chelation groups. If they need to chelate using this protocol, they can find the Andy Cutler Chelation Think Tank or the Fight Autism and Win Biomedical Treatments that Work group. There's some Yahoo groups that a lot of people discuss this on, like the Frequent Dose Chelation Group or the Autism Mercury Group. It's very easy to find some of these by searching the web. You get, you know, 50,000 hits. Yeah, I imagine. Sadly, there's so many people that need it, but good that you have some information that these millions of people can at least make some good of. So, yeah, if you really, really want to know, do I have mercury? The easiest place to start is go to the noamalcolm.com website and click the link. What does mercury do to you? So description of mercury poisoning, the same one in the book. If you read it, you're like, sounds really horrible. You don't have it. If you read it, like, oh, my God, that's me. Maybe you need to look into it more. Yeah, and with the way the world and the environment is today, it sounds like even if you don't have a lot of symptoms, it's not a bad idea to do some of this to just get out what's in there before it becomes symptoms. That's a choice some people might want to make, but... I'm more focused on the people who do have the symptoms and they want to do something about not having the symptoms. For sure. That's really nice, though, that you've uh, opened up all your information and put it out there and 
in your books and your books are not ebooks, right? They're ones sure. that you buy and they, you mail it to them. Is that yeah. correct? Pieces of paper that come in the mail. And are they large books, they hard to read mail. books? I have been pretty surprised that people wait through the amalgam illness book as well as they do, but every, you know, it, it is fairly technical, but I've had pretty good experience with people managing to figure it out basically because they have to, they're set. Their doctor's not going to do it for them. Turns out people are smarter than they give, than they're given credit for. And is there anywhere in the book that's like a schedule where they can? Schedules and discussions. There's the, also that in the hair test book. There's lots of that online. Sounds good. All right. Great. Well, Dr. Cutler, thank you so much. This has been a very special show to me. I understand a lot more than I did before and especially about your work. So I've panned through your site a lot and it's amazing information there. So I recommend even if you haven't gotten the book to go there, like you said, and just click on a bunch of the links there that tell you so much information. It's really a great thing that you're doing. And I just want to say thank you for all your efforts to help so many people injured by vaccines like my mom was. I really appreciate you. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me on the air. Great. And we'll be in touch. All right. Wow, what an amazing amount of information in this show. I'll treasure these last two episodes forever, and also because, you know, they're dedicated to my mom. I hope after hearing all of Dr. Cutler's info, every one of you will find a biological dentist, and slowly as you can afford it, take every single mercury filling out and every single speck of mercury out. And don't forget that often, under a crown, you will find you have mercury under there. Because if they didn't believe that mercury was bad for us in the first place, then they usually leave it there when they put the crown on. I thought I was mercury-free for so many years, and then I went in to replace one of my crowns, and it was loaded with mercury. I then chose to spend the money to remove my second crown, and bingo, it was under there too. I know it's a risk because you could pay to remove it, and there's no mercury under there, and you'll feel you wasted your money. But still, I would do it because mercury vapors are forever and you won't remove it from your brain unless you do his protocol. And honestly, you guys, you can't do his protocol with any mercury in your mouth. And look at all the diseases that mercury causes when it gets in the brain. MS, Parkinson's, ALS, seizures, chronic vertigo. There's so many devastating diseases and symptoms. So to me, it's worth it to have a look under your crowns, even if it turns out there was no mercury under there, it's still worth it. And remember, you can't even begin his chelation process until you're sure you don't have one single speck of mercury in your mouth. My new biological dentist, Dr. Yokoyama, you know, he was on the podcast some episodes ago. He uses these digital x-rays and he just found a speck in one of my teeth. So I still have a little speck of mercury and I have an appointment in two weeks to finally get it out. And I was thinking I was mercury free for 25 years, but now I will be soon. The other things we need to think about are the risks that come with vaccinations. With all the corruption around thimerosal free vaccines, I think we all learned today and last week that it's rare that any of us truly are able to get a mercury free vaccine. Look at all the other dangerous ingredients in them too. So do your research and be sure you're willing to take the risks if you do take that vaccine. It's not my job to tell others what to do, but I do feel it's my job to tell you all about the risks and the truth of what's going on with the vaccines. That was shocking news to me when Dr. Cutler spoke about the corruption of the so-called mercury-free vaccines. I knew about the corruption of the CDC already, and really how little they have our health interests in mind. This is one thing you need to know so you can begin to take your own health responsibilities into your own hands. Be sure you guys to watch the movie Trace Amounts. The link is in the show notes. And did you guys see those YouTube videos I was telling you about last week? It's crazy, the one with the mercury vapors coming from that tooth and the other one where they put the amalgams in the sheep and 30 days later, it's all over his body. 
unbelievable. You have to see them. If you didn't watch them last week, be sure to go to them in the show notes. Don't forget to buy Dr. Cutler's book, especially if you suspect you or anyone you know has mercury symptoms. Be sure to follow his protocol exactly as he lays it out. This is something to take very seriously, everyone, because detoxing mercury from your brain needs to be done in a very specific way. Another thing I learned from Dr. Cutler was how dangerous it is to use cilantro and corella. Now, you can read this all over the internet, what a great detoxer this is, but I'll tell you the reason that is he says, is because it's pulling it out of the blood, but you don't get it all out of the blood. And what recirculates then, you just put it back into your brain. So it's almost as if you're just filling up your brain because you're pulling it out of your blood and maybe even some of your organs. But what doesn't come out then just goes into your blood, which goes into your brain. So please, everyone, just know, do not use Corella or cilantro, no matter what you read on the internet. And the other supplement to be careful about is alpha-lipoic acid, or ALA. Gosh, I was giving this to Lloyd because you read how it really helps people with neuropathy, and they recommend 400 milligrams. And then he tells us, yes, it's an antioxidant. What people don't realize, it's the one supplement that crosses the blood-brain barrier and pulls the mercury out of your brain. So when you're taking 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams or more, you're dumping that mercury out of your brain so fast that your body can't handle it. So be aware, take a look at all your supplements and make sure you're not taking anything with alpha-lipoic acid because it's likely we all have mercury in our brain. And even if you don't have symptoms, you need to make sure first that your mouth is mercury-free and that you don't want to take that high a dose of alpha-lipoic acid until you're sure that you've chelated it properly out of your brain. So I just wanted to give this heads up as a warning also. And lastly, if you do have any mercury poisoning symptoms or you're interested in doing his chelation protocol, don't forget you can join his Dr. Cutler Chelation Think Tank Facebook page. Oh, and that reminds me, any of you guys that are listening that are doing his protocol or already on his Facebook page, I wanted to offer one suggestion. Maybe you guys could talk about it or research it, but I would consider to do some coffee enemas because it really helps clean the liver and the blood. And I know when you're starting to do his chelation, a big part of it is making sure that you know, it gets out of the liver and gets out of the body as fast as possible. I did a little research and I read that some people did really better doing coffee enemas. I'm very experienced with coffee enemas. So if you have any questions, you can ask me, just email me, but at least uh, consider it or do the research. I'm not wanting to advise anything against Dr. Cutler's protocol, but since he said he had no experience with it, he didn't want to comment. So I just wanted to throw this out there to the group. I hope you guys learned a lot the last couple weeks. I sure did. Thank you again, Dr. Cutler, for all the research you did to get yourself well and for putting that protocol together into very clear language for the world to have so they too can get well as you did. As the rate of autism is growing at such an alarming rate, sadly your protocol will get used more and more than ever before. But I'm so grateful for all you have done to help so many. So thank you. Well, you guys, that ends our show today. You know what time it is. It's time to say goodbye. Vidal has spoken. Remember, you heal with a plant-powered diet, homeopathy, and detoxing, of course. Especially mercury detoxing. Peace. Be healthy. Be free. Live life. Live life.